Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove. There's no Taylor Rockwell today. He's out there somewhere, but he's not in studio. This is an interview episode and it's outside of the established Friday interview tradition because some news dropped this weekend in the NASL versus US soccer lawsuit. And the news was not good for NASL as the judge denied their request to force US soccer to give them Division 2 status for 2018. Rather than have Taylor and I try and figure out how that happened and what it all means, I turned to an expert. Mickey Turner is a lawyer in Washington State, a Seattle Sounders season ticket holder, and, as you'll hear, a man who's been following this lawsuit as it's progressed. In this episode, I essentially ask Mickey to walk me through what's happening in an easy-to-understand, non-legalese kind of way. So, if you've been half paying attention to this NASL versus US soccer case, but it all seems a bit complicated, this is the show for you. We're going to explain it, analyze it, and then we're going to think about what happens next. Also... We're going to talk about Clint Dempsey because Mickey was at the second leg of the playoff game this weekend, so I couldn't resist asking. The interview ends with me making a weak Bill and Ted joke, which Mickey very politely laughs at, but everything up until that point is gold, I promise. If you're looking for US men's national team roster talk, it hadn't dropped at time of recording. Taylor and I have plans to record a show Tuesday evening where we hope to celebrate the inclusion of both Tyler Adams and Weston McKinney and hopefully Jonathan Gonzalez as well. Check back with us Tuesday night for that episode. But first, let's go to American Soccer Law School. Mickey Turner in the state of Washington. Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. And thanks, Daryl. Uh, thanks for having me. I've, I've been a fan of your show for uh, at least a couple of years, uh, and uh, I've listened to pretty much every episode. Oh, great. Great. So I, I've been following you on Twitter for a little while, um, mostly because of the uh, the NASL US soccer lawsuit. I've, I've kind of found this sort of weird Twitter niche where people are <laughs> analyzing um, all the legal action um, in this suit. I feel like you're sort of, you're part of this little enclave of people doing so. Yeah, it's been kind of funny. Uh, you know, Professor Stephen Bank and uh, Neil Morris, yeah. among others, uh, we just, you know, kind of formed this little uh, collective of, of analysts kind of going over the case. Um, and I, I really didn't even get into it um, until I realized that my I have a federal uh, uh, bar number, essentially. And so I'm, you know, I can access PACER, which is what all of the attorneys have been kind of using to get all the information. Oh, wow. So that's one like, day I just happened to. That's, it's like having that oh, HBO right? login. Yeah, yeah it, it's totally what it is. <laughs> um, and so I just kind of, uh, you know, decided to check it out one day. And, you know, I just kind of got stuck in the weeds. I found the case um, because, you know, what? Uh, pretty much everyone has been following along ever since the NSL uh, filed the lawsuit. Yeah. And, you know, just from that point, uh, you know, I just kind of got hooked on it. It's, you know, kind of like a, a book, you know, you just start <laughs> reading and you just, uh, you can't stop. And they sort of release a new chapter every once in a while. Yeah, exactly. So that's even the best <laughs> part, even better than your just standard book. You're, you're always getting something new to, di- to digest. Um, so I know, I know that you're a Seattle Sanders fan. We talked off air a little bit before we started recording. Um, so why the interest in NASL? Because I, as I understand it, you're not in an area where there's an NASL team, so I assume it's not from fandom of an NASL team. Oh no, no, not really. I, you know, there's not even a team until you know until what, last year, San Francisco uh, joined. Yeah, so the there wasn't Deltas, any I believe. Within like, say that again. The Deltas is that what they were called? Yeah, San Francisco Deltas. Yeah, yeah. and they just joined uh, what last year. And then there's the Edmonton team, but those are obviously many, many, many miles away. Right. Uh, so. Yeah, really, you know, I'm a U.S. national team fan, obviously. Um, and so I've just been kind of following along uh, as, you know, NASL and uh, USSF have been fighting it out. And uh, that's kind of how I got interested in the case to begin with. So your interest is more um, then, ca- yeah. kind of like mine, like big picture, like future of soccer in America kind yeah. of interest. 100%, 100%. You know, my, my thing is I just like to see something resolved at some point. Yes, um, and same so here. Everybody kind of knows where to go. Yeah, I want the arguments over, so we just sort of have okay. This is what we've got, and this is what we're going to do with it, as opposed to the endless round and round and round and round. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Is you know, obviously, you know, as an attorney, and you don't even need to necessarily be an attorney to be interested. But just kind of looking at the filings and just kind of going through that, it's been it's been fascinating. Kind of starting at the end and then working my way back 
to kind of see where things fell apart between the NSL and uh, USSF. Um, and it's, you know, you can definitely see, um, you know, starting around 2015, uh, that the relationship was just, uh, you know, beyond repair. So before we get into that, and I want to give our listeners a heads up, is we're sort of going to try and explain it in the least legalese way possible so that people can understand it. Um, I t- yeah. uh, we talked off air a bit before. You um, you were at the Sounders game, the playoff game, uh, where they beat Vancouver. Um, Taylor and I didn't do any sort of detailed coverage of that game. We just basically saw Clint Dempsey's two goals. So I really wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Like, what was the atmosphere like and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a great atmosphere. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, talk about how the uh, Western Conference hasn't been particularly uh, fun to watch right. um, with a bunch of zero-zero ties. So, um, you, know, I, you know, the Sounders, I think, played better in both legs. Uh, they were just, uh, you know, they just ran into a Vancouver side up in Vancouver who didn't really want to do anything. And so, you know, coming back down here uh, with the zero-zero result, uh, you know, the fans were pretty nervous because obviously one goal. And you end up kind of like Portland was, where you know mm-hmm. you've got to score twice to to win. So, but you know, fortunately for us, uh, Dempsey scored you know relatively early, I guess. Um, and so that kind of took a took a little bit of the pressure off. But you know, until the eighty some odd minute, we were still one goal away from going home. So there was just that kind of nervous atmosphere in the stadium. And then you know Dempsey gets the second one, and that pretty much puts the game to bed. But uh, you know. Like I said, it was kind of a nervous atmosphere, but it was a great atmosphere itself. Vancouver had a decent traveling away uh, support, which is pretty good for a weeknight. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the stadium was pretty packed. Um, I've got to ask about Dempsey. Was there, is, did anyone sort of get mad at him for that silly elbow um, that got him suspended for the first leg? Or are Seattle fans sort of so in love with him that they're willing to overlook that transgression that sort of put him out of a playoff game? Oh, I think there was definitely some um, anger at Dempsey for what happened. Uh, a lot of fans were uh, just upset that he did something like that. And, you know, Dempsey's one of those guys, I love to hate him guy. Yeah. Um, you love him when you're, he's on your team, hate him when he's uh, <laughs> on the opposition. And, you know, he's gotten a couple of red cards in the past. Actually, I think he's only had uh, two in a game. Uh, one but he's, was he's the only four, player I've seen uh, tearing up a referee's notebook. Yes, and that was one of them. Uh, and I, I wasn't at that game. I was actually watching on YouTube, but that's a whole different story. Um, but he's only had two, like two red cards, I think, in in a game, and he got uh, the disciplinary committee got him on another one. Yeah. So and, you know he he doesn't have that many red cards, but I think it was just the context of doing it the game before we start the playoffs. Yeah. And with us going having to go to Vancouver to start, that fans were definitely. A little, little sour at him for what he did, um, even though I would say that there was a certain percentage of fans who did not think he did anything wrong in that he didn't intentionally try to elbow somebody. Uh, he was just trying to get position, and his elbow kind of caught the guy. So I, there was definitely that same that you, portion if, of the fan base as if, well. If you were representing Dempsey in a court of law, uh, if you imagine there was some weird court of law where it was all about Dempsey's elbow, could you <laughs> could you get him off? Uh I would, you know, my my go to would be on the intent angle, yeah. where he was just trying to, like I said, get position, kind of doing like a, a swim move in football, just trying to get away from the guy, and you know, elbows happen in those situations. Uh, <laughs> I think you'd need a lenient judge. I don't think, it, I don't think that's like the case. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you're good, but nobody's that good. I don't think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At that point, you just you might want to try to get a plea deal. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's classic Dempsey to then come back and sort of score the goals that that sort of redeem him, right? That's the classic Dempsey story. Yeah, I mean he's still he's still you know if not the best player on the team, second best. Uh, you know, Nico uh, Ladero obviously. Yeah. We get top billing, but it's either him or or Nico. Um, and so I think the fans still understand that you know you're going to take the good with the bad with Dempsey and most of it is good. Um, and so you're willing to deal with it for the most part. Final question I have on the Sounders. Um, any chance Jordan Morris is back from injury in time to play any part in 2017 or is he just officially done for the whole year? So I actually went to practice a couple of weeks ago um, just to kind of check it out. Um, actually, I kind of this USF stuff was uh, uh, starting to explode. Um, and so I was able to see him uh, him and Ozzy Alonso were both obviously out at that point. Um, and 
at that point, Ozzy was clearly ahead of, of Jordan. Um, and so from what the last I've heard is that his, uh, his doctor, his dad, uh, oh, said course, that yeah. he was about yeah, two weeks away. Uh, so that would put him at least in, say, the 18 for the first leg against Houston. And then maybe he comes back um, on the 30th and is able to play a bigger role. Um, but, you know, fingers crossed, it sounds like he'll be ready uh, by the end of the month at worst, unless he suffers a setback. All right, so maybe a nice option off the bench to just see what, you know, if needed, you can see what he can do for 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly, in the game, especially in the game at, at Houston, um, because, again, that game is nearly three weeks out. So yeah, I I, I would expect that he'll, he'll be back for the, the home leg on the 30th and be, uh, at least be able to do something. All right, so we'll look ahead to uh, to that game as it rolls nearer. But the big news I wanted to talk to you about today, it actually happened on Saturday, I believe, is when the um, the decision came down from, correct me if I'm wrong, Judge Brody. Um, to, That's correct. To not grant, and I don't have the terms correctly, but so I'm going to say it in layman's terms, but to essentially um, not compel U.S. soccer to give to let NASL retain their Division Two status. I think that's more or less correct, right? But can we can we roll back and maybe if you could explain what the original sort of um, NASL lawsuit with US Soccer is? I, I know there are two parts of it, so could you maybe explain yeah. uh, the two parts to it? So yeah, there's there's basically two parts to the lawsuit. The and they actually somewhat conflict with each other hmm. um, in that the what they wanted ultimately. At least that's what it, this is what it appears is they want that uh, they want the USSF to be found to have conspired, colluded, agreed to uh, restrain trade as to the North American Soccer League um, based on a number of actions that they took, um, mainly gar- um, with regards to the professional league standards or PLS for short. So that's the so those are the want... sort of criteria that US soccer st- sets out in order for a league to attain Division One status, Division Two status, and Division Three status. That's what the uh, the the PLS or the PSL that that's the acronym I keep seeing, and that's one of those things that I feel like if people aren't in aren't in that niche that you're in, might be like, what what is this acronym? I don't know what this is all about. So I've, I've been guessing at yeah. that. Is that the correct uh, definition? Yeah, the professional league standards is uh, what. Uh the USSF set out back in the early or mid nineties um, after their, uh, they were awarded the world cup. Right. And as part of that, uh, the, we were required, or I just didn't say we, but the United States uh, soccer federation was required to start a division one team. And as part of that, they decided that because of the failures of soccer in the United States previously, and the level of interest in it at that time, that there were uh, certain standards that needed to be put in place to basically give soccer a, a landing um, pad to get started. And so those standards included number of teams, time zones, certain financial considerations, um, all of those kind of things that said you basically need to jump over these hurdles to be able to be designated Division One or Division Two. And obviously the amount of teams and financial considerations and et cetera, et cetera, vary depending on what division you were going to shoot for. And so my understanding is that NASL are saying that um, in that, what would you call this a complaint, I guess is, or how would, yeah. How, yeah. So their complaint is that um, in the long term, us soccer has sort of conspired with major league soccer and soccer United marketing to make it impossible for NASL to hit division one status. But in the short term, they've also sort of, made sure that NESL couldn't even get Division 2 status, which is what they've been used to having. And then if they drop to Division 3 status, then all of a sudden NESL is in all kinds of trouble. Yeah, so uh, the Division uh, 1, obviously NESL has never qualified for outright. I mean, they just never had either the number of teams, time zones, financial uh, you know considerations, or what have you. Yeah, um, just, just having Raul so- won't do it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and that's obviously that's actually one of the other uh, constraints. Uh, you can't have multiple owners um, mm-hmm. owning the same, um, you know, or single. You, you can't have one owner owning multiple teams. Right. Um, and so, yeah. So NHL has just never qualified um, for Division One. For Division Two, they uh, back in like 2010 or 2011, they also uh, 
failed to qualify for that, but they made you know they did some things to kind of change it around, and then they were eventually granted uh, Division Two with a number of waivers right. um, as to teams, you know, financials, uh, time zones, um, field, you know, uh, field dimensions, and that kind of thing. There's a, there's a ton. I shouldn't say a ton, but there's a, quite a few different uh, requirements that you need to meet to be uh, designated as a Division One or Division Two or Division Three, um, and NASL for most of its history has never gotten over all of those hurdles in one year. I think 2013 is the only year where they met all of the standards to be designated division two. All right. To, to bring this back to the center, um, what were the specific, uh, the, the two parts that we were talking about, talking about to begin yeah. this, what are the two, the two things that NESL were looking for? All right. So uh, first of all, uh, with respect to I think, you know, their ultimate, goal is essentially to have the standards thrown out and, or to have it determined that USSF has no authority to um, regulate those standards okay. or to even impose them at all. Right. So, so they, want, so the, they want it so that US soccer can't say you're D1, you're D2, you're D3. They just want that authority taken away from them entirely. Yes. Uh, their position is that those standards are number one, they're inherently anti-competitive and that USSF has no authority through the law to impose any standards at all. Okay. Um, you know, and then that, yeah, my, yeah, so that's, that's the ultimate goal. And my understanding USSF, is that, uh, that, NASL. that part of it has not been decided yet. The decision that that's came correct. down at the weekend was in relation to the other part of NESL's complaint. So what was the what was the other part and what was the decision? Okay, so yeah, so while they are waiting for that ultimate decision to come down, they wanted the court to essentially force the USSF to grant them the status of Division Two. And the reason that obviously that's important for NASL is they don't believe they can survive as a Division Three or an unsanctioned team. Right. Um, and so that's obviously very, very important to them, um, as we've seen kind of their instability over the years, mm -hmm. even at the Division Two level. Division Three, you can imagine uh, what that would do for sponsors, for players, uh, and all of those uh, sorts of things. Yeah, it's like they would have sort of the stink on them, right? They're like no one, no one wanted to, would want to be associated with the Division Three league. So you might lose some sponsors yeah. or be unable to gain some sponsors. And that's the thing I kept seeing in the. Uh, in the legal filings as sort of um, harm is the phrase I kept seeing uh, uh, referred to. Yeah. So uh, the harm thing, and I, we can get into that a little later, yeah. um, but yes, yeah, so, so the bottom line is they don't think they can survive as, as a division three league. There is no division three at the moment right. at all. Uh, uh, USL is planning to start one um, in 2019, but they they don't have one. And then there's, I think Peter Weld is trying to start one through the NISA, which is, was supposed to be aligned with the NASL as we get into academic and theater. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, there's not even a division three right now. So you can imagine again, how NASL feels. So uh, to bring it back around to what they are asking the court to do or what they wanted the court to do this weekend, they wanted the court to basically, as I said, uh, force USSF to grant them division two status for the 2018 season while they fight out the trial on the, ultimate sanctioning authority of USSF and the, uh, and the uh, Sherman Act violations. And then the and decision that, that came down was? The decision that came down on Saturday morning uh, was that the court declined to grant the injunction, which would have forced USSF to grant NASL Division Two. So this is obviously a huge blow to the NASL. Um, how, how did the – Judge Brody, how did Judge Brody sort of um, – explain uh, the reasoning behind the decision yeah so yeah a massive blow as you said they've already appealed again we can get into that a little later but um the reasoning uh there's there's a bunch of elements uh that the court went through but the one to focus on was because the uh nasl was asking the court to force the ussf to do something the standard for the NASL was much higher than a standard preliminary injunction. It's called a mandatory injunction. You may have heard, uh, you know, seen that phrase thrown uh, around. 
But does a mandatory mean, injunction does, basic, it, does it mean like a mandatory injunction means we force U.S. soccer to do something essentially? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The court is basically saying you need to you need to designate them as a division two. And, and so, so you the said standard, the standard for that is higher. because you're yeah, oh, much higher. It's kind of like the difference, you know, to put it into a sports analogy. It's kind of like doing the 110 meter hurdles, and one of the hurdles <laughs> being doing the high jump. It's just it's it's a much higher um, hurdle to get over, um, and the courts do not impose those likely because you're forcing somebody to do something. Right. You're basically getting what you want at the start of the case as opposed to the end of the case. Got it. So is that is that why she right? Is it Margot Brody? So uh, she um, is that why. Yeah, my- is that why she didn't grant it then? Just because the you know the the high jump bar was too high? Yeah, but essentially that's what happened. There was one. There's one main thing that uh, you NASL just couldn't overcome, at least in the judge's eyes, is that because you're at the higher standard, the the, the threshold is that you have to show that you are clearly entitled to the relief that you're seeking. I see. So. Um, as opposed to just more likely than not, which is kind of you know the fifty one forty nine, uh, you know standard that you think of in a in a civil trial. Just you, you know, the win in a civil trial, you just have to be just a little bit over the edge. Whereas with the clearly likely, it's just it's it's a much higher standard. I, I couldn't put it in the percentage, but you know, think if if it's fifty one forty nine for a standard civil trial, you're thinking like you know sixty five seventy percent. All right. And I think something just became kind of clear to me, the, the thinking behind this. Um, I imagine if I'm an ASL, I'm arguing it's hard for us to reach these standards because because the uh, US soccer and MLS and Soccer United marketing are kind of doing this anti-competitive thing and they're stopping us from progressing. And that's the reason we couldn't hit the D2 standards. But then I imagine the judge is sort of not not sort of inclined to think about all the background and just to think about do you hit the D2 standards? No. Therefore um, it's really hard for me to say that U.S. soccer has to give you D2 status. Well, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the end, but what NASL's problem was, I mean, they could, you know, it's an, it's possible that NASL ultimately is able to prove that there was some conspiracy or an agreement. Yeah. Maybe in the course of discovery, they find an email, they find a contract, they find some voicemail, they find some video of them sitting around drinking scotch and laughing about how they're going to screw NASL. Right. <laughs> but they don't have any of that stuff right now. All they've got is some inferences, some coincidences, some questionable stuff from the USSF as the judge outlined. But it's kind of, you know, in the, in the court transcript, uh, you know, after the hearing, the court basically said, there's some smoke here, but, the court wasn't sure if there was enough to show that they could clearly, uh, they were clearly like to, likely to uh, prevail on their trial. Ultimately. I see. I see. So they would have been granted it if it was like looking very obvious that they would ultimately prevail in the, uh, in the bigger picture trial. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there was a whistleblower from the USSF who was going to, who wrote a declaration saying I was part of the meetings that uh, Sunil and Don Garber had right. uh, where they talked about how they were going to, uh, prevent NASL from reaching a D1 or D2. Right. You know, that would obviously be a massive thing to have, but they didn't have anything like that. So there's no like Google They've Calendar got... meeting titled, let's screw NASL. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's essentially what you need, or at least some, <laughs> they, they needed more than they had, and they didn't have enough, at least according to the judge. And But the judge said that there was some smoke, right? So did anything come out in these <laughs> documents or in the judge's sort of, you know, decision um, that makes U.S. soccer, like, doesn't prove anything legally, but makes U.S. soccer or Major League soccer look bad? Yeah, I would say the uh, the court spent a decent amount of time on uh, the professional league standards that were proposed, proposed to be changed in 2015. Uh, those, you know, the PLS, that we talk, as we talked about, were instituted in the mid-'90s. They were changed again in, I think, 20, uh, 2008, 2010, and then 2014. And those changes were sometimes incremental. Uh, sometimes they were more uh, significant. As po- uh, I think uh, the uh, number of teams was raised uh, um, during one of those changes. I can't remember if it was 2010 or 2014. But they were proposed to be in the 2015 uh, situation. Uh, USSF was going to uh, increase those standards again. And that's the one that NASL really fought 
uh, because they uh, they thought it was basically prohibiting them from getting to D1 status. So it's like a moving um, the goalposts success- type argument. Yeah, yeah, and there and you know there was some smoke there. I have to say, uh, just based on the timing, um, US uh, or NASL at that point was going for D1, um, and then uh, these 2015 standards come out, and uh, NASL's you know what the hell. Why are, you, uh, why are you changing these standards or proposing to change these standards right as we're going for a D1? Um, ultimately, those 2015 uh, standards changes were not implemented, um, but the court was not impressed with the timing um, relative to USSF. So that was, <clears throat> excuse me, definitely a point towards showing the conspiracy. So now NASL have appealed um, the, the decision is there? Do you see any chance that they can get this decision overturned and get this preliminary injunction that makes US soccer give them D two status? Yeah. So the uh, the ruling came down on Saturday. They filed their notice of appeal uh, today um, or, or or late yesterday, um, and they are basically going to appeal the court's ruling, um, essentially as to her application of the law. Um, the odds of that are, it's going to be a tough for them because they basically have to find that the judge abused her discretion in applying the law, which basically means that she just didn't know what she was doing when she made the initial ruling. Wow. And is that's that, obviously that seems a, aggressive. Is that, is that normal for an appeal or, or is that weird to sort of be saying, well, the judge was just doing it wrong? Uh, it, that's a, that's an excellent question. Uh, it the ju- the the attorney that USSF or NASL has is an aggressive attorney. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that he came with the fire that he did <laughs> reading um, his motion to appeal. It was uh, he was fairly contentious of the ruling from the uh, from Judge Brody. So, uh, but that doesn't. Uh, it's still going to be tough for them um, to jump that hurdle um as i said you know if you're if you're doing a high jump for the underlying motion you're doing a pole vault for <laughs> trying to find abuse of discretion of a standard that's already high to begin with i see i see all right shall we um move on to the um the second half of this which is you know the bigger um the bigger complaint about u.s soccer not having the authority to designate divisional status um yeah if assume because this this uh, this first part was denied d- can we read anything into that in terms of what happens with the second part um no i don't think so not not necessarily i mean the judge did give some clues as to what she was thinking about um especially with the uh professional league standards and ussf ussf ability to um regulate them or impose them at all she wasn't really impressed with um nasl's argument that the so- uh, United States Soccer Federation couldn't impose standards whatsoever. Okay. Um, the judge or the uh, attorney for uh, NASL, you know, walked that line a couple of times um, on that argument, and the judge kept, you know, chiding, not chiding him, but at least making it clear that she believed that uh, USSF has the authority through FIFA and with the agreement of the member uh, leagues, um, NASL. U.S. Um, um, MLS and USL to uh, in, you know to impose standards and regulate them. So uh, that's going to be tough, at least as far as uh, I can see. Now, the court, or I should say, NASL has long thought that uh, USSF didn't have the ability to impose these standards, although they they have usually complained about. Um, the standards being too onerous and not that USSF can impose them at all. And this goes to, you know, the time zone argument saying that why are we having to have times uh, teams in time zones, East central and Pacific when it used to be, you could have them in any three time zones in the continental U S right. why do we have to have 12 teams when it was eight before? Um, and so that's generally been their complaint, but underlying all that is, I don't believe that they think that USSF should be imposing them at all or have the ability to. 
And then maybe stepping away from sort of the legal aspects of this, isn't there a chance that if the lack of D2 status really does do NESL sort of serious harm that they can't come back from? And even if sort of teams start leaving, because I know that some teams can, they have like an exit clause where they pay less to exit the NASL if they're Mm -hmm. not a D2 team. I mean, is there a chance that they're not even, they don't even exist as an ongoing operation to sort of see through the rest of this case? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting uh, you know consequence if they actually fold up shop. Who's left uh, that has standing to pursue the lawsuit? Um, based on what I've read from uh, some folks who follow NASL uh, closer than I do, uh, like Napoom Chopra and uh, uh, Neil Morris, um, I, it sounds to me like, and again, this is just on based on what I've read from those guys is uh, Rocco Camuso, who's uh, the Cosmos uh, owner, I think he's uh, on the head of the board of the NSL, mm-hmm. seems to want to fight this thing through to the end. So whether that means that he's willing to basically bankroll all a, a sufficient amount of NASL teams so that they are in some form still active uh, is an open question. Well, so um, you're, you're saying that you could have just one guy – keeping the league going just so that he can keep the lawsuit going. I mean, it, it's, it's theoretically possible. They, you know, again, based on some reporting that had been done, at least three of the NSL owners were going to financially support the new teams that they had coming in. Right. Um, so it was going to be three, uh, three owners basically bankrolling. I think that was at least five to six um, MPSL teams um, until they can get on their feet on their own. So that is a plausible course of action for them if they want to be an ongoing concern while the lawsuit um, is still going. Now, whether they would be able to get any type of division sanctioning in the meantime is another right. question because that would require require a number of waivers um, beyond what they were asking for previously. So, so and they might, the, they might and have to be like a renegade league of some sort. Yeah, and then obviously that brings up a bunch of FIFA or FIFA issues uh, with not being sanctioned by your your home, you know, your home federation. Um, but the other thing uh, I think you mentioned uh, was that uh, teams leaving. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a you know a, a not very well kept secret that North Carolina FC, which is one of the uh, in the ASL teams, is at minimum considering moving to. Uh, USL, right. As soon as this case is determined, which could be, or not as soon as the case is determined, but as soon as the season's over, which is uh, I think next Saturday or Sunday is when the uh, NASL Soccer Bowl is. Yeah. And so uh, they could be gone. The uh, Jacksonville owner tweeted out something about seven days until they don't have a home, um, which implies at least that he's going to be open to uh, finding a new place to play. And then, obviously, you've got the um, issue with the Deltas basically not going to be in existence <laughs> um, mm-hmm. once they play in the championship, which raises the issue of a team winning a championship and then immediately folding. Um, and then you've got the Cosmos. Um, who who knows what's going to happen with them? Uh, they haven't um, shown any inclination to join USL. Um, and so you've got – and then you've got the five or six teams that were – supposedly going to be bankrolled by uh, Rocco um, and the other owners. So you could have as many as, you know, five to six of the eight teams that are currently in NASL either folding up shop or looking for other places to play. I've got, I've got to be honest, my sort of personal opinions here are that sort of, I don't necessarily care for the NASL as a league because they've caused – so much trouble and being kind of um, there's been so much instability among the teams that are sort of in the league I care more about just the the idea of the teams that are there surviving in some way and I think if they if as many teams as possible could get sort of a, a lifeboat to another league be it USL or, or somewhere else I think I'd be okay with that that being the end result maybe no more NASL but all the teams survive um, and maybe New York Cosmos have to kind of take a bit of a hit uh reputation wise because they kind of seem to be the the flagship for this battle um but i, I yeah. think i'd be okay with that 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 situation ending up that way because then we would have the sort of stability that we talked about yeah so and this is actually interesting um as to what happened uh about this time last year when uh 
an air cell was about to implode. Uh, there was a, uh, a document that was filed as part of the USSF filings uh, that at least six of the uh, US, uh, NASL teams were in discussions with USL about joining up. Yeah, um, I remember that. Ultimately, it, it didn't happen. Um, I, I think they did not like the offer that USL made. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even an offer. I think it was an offer to consider uh, certain things. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, uh, Rocco came in and saved the Cosmos, um, and then they were able to get uh, provisional uh, Division Two sanctioning. But at least, you know, at that point, there were a bunch of teams that were okay going to USL, or at least um, exploring the opportunity, I should say. Um, you know, I think it's pretty clear they don't like how the USL, uh, USL, how they you know, run their their franchise system. Mm -hmm. um, the fees were pretty high. You have to give up your intellectual property. <clears throat> You have to, uh, you know, give. I think there was a provision that you had to give Nike right or the first refusal um, on apparel and some such stuff for 60 days. So, a number of those teams didn't like all of that stuff. But again, under with this new situation in place, maybe they decide that uh, that's worth it to survive. Yeah, that, I, can, I can see that making sense. Uh, the, the other question I had uh, legally was about the. Um the court of arbitration for sport case that I think is Miami FC and Kingston stockade. That's essentially about sort of forcing um, us soccer to implement promotion relegation. Um, does any of this case have any bearing on that case or is it just two completely separate things? Cause I I'm thinking just cause obviously Miami FC are an NASL team. So they're kind of involved in both, in both cases. Yes. Uh, you know, I haven't been following that case as closely, uh, but as far as the ultimate outcome of this case, um, it's, you know, there's been some chatter, and I, I guess I started some of that chatter, that <laughs> if NASL were to win this case on the ultimate issue and have USSF stripped of sanctioning authority or ability to impose any standards, that that would be the end for any type of promotion relegation um, in the United States because there would be no federation with the authority to sanction anything. Um, hmm. and so, oh, then MLS would just sort of rule the waves on its own. <clears throat> yeah. MLS would just kind of do their own thing. Yeah. Um, with USL as you know, there's, you know, second division partner and then maybe NSL and NISA do their kind of own thing. Now, whether FIFA is happy with that arrangement is another issue. They can impose their own, uh, sanctions for not having a, a home federation, but, at least as far as that case is concerned, it, it would tend to be the end of any ability to have pro rel. Ooh, okay. So get, yeah, it just gets more and more complicated. It feels like, um, final, final question I have for you on this is what's the next thing that we're looking for in terms of news, like next, next court decision, for example. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, with the notice of appeal, the parties agreed, um, I guess just to, I should back up a little bit. Yeah. USSF had uh, filed a motion to dismiss this case entirely. Oh wow! Um, and like, briefing, just get out of here. yeah, just get it. Yeah, basically, uh, uh, NASL cannot you know, prevail as a matter of law. Um, and so briefing had been set up. I think USSF was scheduled to have their motion um, on the 11th of November or thereabouts. And then uh, NASL was supposed to have a reply in December, and then. Uh, the case could potentially be argued uh, about the end of the year. Uh, both parties filed a joint motion. The court approved a uh, order basically holding off on that until this appeal is finished. Um, you know, which makes sense uh, because if, if, if NASL is uh, telling the truth and I have no reason to believe they are to that, this is going to basically end them. If they don't get this injunction, mm -hmm. then at that point, the case, is it's possible the case goes away um, and there's no me need to have a motion to dismiss um, from USSF. So both parties agreed to just stay that. Um, so with respect to the appeal, uh, both parties have presented their proposed schedules on that. Um, I think ultimately uh, NASL wanted to have this appeal heard at the end of, this, of November around the 27th and USSF wanted to have uh, it heard mid December. Obviously that's only a difference of two weeks. Um, so assuming the court is agreeable to have this heard on an expedited, uh, manner, then you could see this appeal being heard. We'll split the difference and say 
December 7th or thereabouts. Okay, so we're expecting maybe a month then until the appeal is heard? And then that's at- correct. If the court grants the expedited uh, hearing, which I don't see any reason why they would not. And then the next thing after that would be U.S. Soccer's uh, motion to have the case dismissed would be the next thing down the road. Yeah. So uh, if if NASL wins the appeal, um, then USSF then will file uh, their motion to uh, re, you know have it rescheduled so it could be argued. Um, if NASL loses, then who knows what could happen because they'll still be without Division Two sanctioning, which they say will cause the end of the league. Uh, so it's possible the case goes away if NASL dismands and Rocco decides he doesn't want to keep funding a lawsuit. Um, they could continue on as a unsanctioned league at that point because they uh, remember when NA or when USSF declined to give them D2 status. They gave them a month to d- apply for D3, and NASL said, you know, just blew it off, essentially. So they don't even, at that point, they don't even have, they're an unsanctioned league. They haven't applied uh, for D3, and there's no indication that uh, USSF would let them reapply for D2. So they're essentially an unsanctioned league at that point. I hope with, we don't get there. I hope that's yeah. not the case because that would be sort of depressing, I think, or at least worrying because yeah. it would say a lot about the American soccer landscape if there was a league that was just sort of rogue and unsanctioned. It just basically says we're an unorganized soccer country that can't get its house in order. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much where they're at. It, you have a basically a zombie NASL at that point. Uh, you've got a USSF who will have asserted its authority but has some issues with respect to how they kind of deal with these issues. And then you have MLS and, um, you know, kind of out there doing their own thing with uh, USL. And then you have the SUM, Soccer United Marketing, uh, out there as well uh, with its potential conflicts of interest uh, between uh, USSF and uh, MLS. So it, it, it doesn't do much to stabilize the soccer pyramid such that it is. Ooh, okay, so I feel like we're ending on a bit of a down note. Is there is there anything else? Yeah. <laughs> is there... I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's not your fault. It's uh, it's the state of American soccer's fault, right? Um, is there um, anything we haven't touched on that sort of needs illuminating for people who are interested in you know following this story? Yeah, um, I, I would say the other thing besides the uh, professional league standards is the soccer united marketing aspect of things. Yeah, um, that might be something to focus on. Um, the court didn't find that the agreement between uh, USSF and uh, MLS was inherently anti-competitive or, uh, yeah, I guess anti-competitive. But the court found that their, the financial interests could cause a problem, but ultimately decided that uh, USSF had provided enough safeguards to overcome any conflicts, um, mainly that's by having any board members with an interest in MLS or Soccer United marketing uh, to abstain from voting um, on professional league standards. So uh, that is something the NSL was not very happy with because they thought that that basically proved their case. Yeah. But the court basically said, well, there, is, there are some conflicts, but uh, it seems there are enough safeguards. And the other point that the court, uh, USSF raised, which was actually a pretty good point, is that uh, based on the way that uh, you know soccer is in this country, you have to have people involved with soccer making decisions um, because who else would be making those types of decisions? So there's always going to be soccer people involved in uh, in the USSF. So and isn't the um, isn't the sort of the the story of Soccer United marketing is that it's sort of needed to exist at a time when soccer was struggling at the MLS. So Major League Soccer was struggling and U.S. Soccer and Major League Soccer, and to some extent the Mexican Federation, I believe, needed to come together to try and just um, establish something that would help them sort of maximize some revenues. Yeah, yeah. And that's and that's uh, what the core, uh, what USSF raised. They basically said, look, uh, there was not a real market for soccer in the late 90s we needed to do something to try to at least get some steady revenues into the United States Soccer Federation so they could make money, they could disperse it in the interest of growing soccer in the country. Uh, the court more or less bought that, um, although NASL pointed out uh, that basically 
the fact that there may be some good benefits to that doesn't necessarily prevent it from being a conflict. Right. Also, maybe one of the good things that come out of this is that Suck United Marketing gets a bit of a um, a redesign or is maybe disbanded in some way. Or maybe maybe US soccer, after the presidential election, has to look at it and sort of be a bit more transparent and open it up a little bit. Yeah, so and, and that's kind of what I think will be one of the good things that comes out of this is is likely that uh, the USSF will have to re- re-examine the, uh, the potential conflicts of interest to make sure there are stronger safeguards in place. Um, more transparency um, as to some is probably a good thing. Um, and so I think this will, at, at worst, this will provide a, um, a scare into the USSF to re-examine some of its practices. Um, that may not be enough for many people in this country, but at least it's a start. But that's kind of where we are at the moment. And the, I think the main problem is that NASL has been, is not, doesn't come into this case with clean hands. Mm-hmm. so to speak, because of their mismanagement, which you know they admit, at least in part. Um, and so they were the imperfect vessel for this suit, but that's what they had to go with. All right, so I feel like we've ended on pretty much a positive. I feel, I feel pretty good about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Mickey, for taking the time to talk to me uh, this evening. Um, if people want to follow you on Twitter, um, what, what is your, your Twitter handle? Oh, yes. Uh, anyone who wants to follow along with this uh, as we go further down the rabbit hole can uh, <laughs> just follow me at Turner ESQ, T-U-R-N-E-R-E-S-Q. I've always wondered, is ESQ Esquire, as in uh, a legal? Yeah, yeah, yeah not okay. very original. <laughs> well, the, the first time I ever heard it was in uh, Bill and Ted, uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, where they refer to each other as Esquire. And I was thinking, these guys aren't, these guys aren't legally qualified. What's all that about? Um, so now, yeah, now I finally understand what the, the real deal is. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for having me on the show. I appreciate it. And like I said, I will uh, look forward to uh, listening to more. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Mickey.